Oh, I was fully good. vaccinated and was able to make it home to Tennessee, seeing them for the first time since November 2019. So wonderful, wonderful. I'm glad Blessed. you're safe, getting some good cooking, I'm sure. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Welcome, mother. We're glad you're here. We love your family. You got a great, a great daughter, a great family. All right. All right, we're gonna um, be looking at 2 Corinthians today. We're gonna be looking at 2 Corinthians, I believe chapter 10. Let me get there myself. We're gonna be looking at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 and we're gonna focus in on verses four and five, but I'm gonna read verses one through six of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, glad to see uh, Eric Horn, Stephanie, looks like we got some other people joining here in just a moment. I'll give them a chance to get logged in. Good afternoon, Marjorie. Glad to have you on with us today. Hi, Pastor. How are you? Oh, fine, and you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm great. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 1 through 5 is what I'm going to read. But also I want to read um, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 through 20. So if you want to put a pen in 2 Corinthians and then uh, we'll move over to Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through 20. I'll talk about winning in spiritual warfare. I want to talk about winning in spiritual warfare, all right? Winning in spiritual warfare. All right. All right. Y'all ready to get started? Let's get started. Let me open this up in prayer and then we'll jump in and see how far God will take us today. Father, in Jesus' name, we love you, we honor you, we bless you and praise you, we glorify you, we lift you up, Lord. We declare that you are great and you are greatly to be praised. God, you are our Father, and we know that you love us as your children. So I pray today, Lord, you'll bless my brothers and sisters who are on this call. I pray, Lord, for their ears to be attentive to what the Spirit has to say to the church. I pray, Lord, that we would not only be hearers of your word, but we'll walk out of this Zoom call, this Bible study, doers of your holy and righteous word. Lord, we have so many opportunities that you've presented to us, doors that you want to open and ways that you want to make blessings and favor and grace and mercy that you pour into our lives. And for that, God, we're thankful. But God, we're also not ignorant of the enemy's devices that even when you present opportunity, the enemy will come along with opposition. So I pray today, Lord God, that you'll give us strategies. You'll give us ways to handle the devices and plans of the enemy in the invisible realm so that we don't get caught up in his opposition and we miss your opportunities. Lord, I pray that we would be obedient to everything that you've given us to do, that you might get the glory out of our lives and we might get the blessing from it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. All right, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And I'm going to read verses one through five, and then we're going to move over to first to Ephesians chapter six, verse 10. It's going to give some context in what I want to share today. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Here's what it says. New King James. Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am I lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we were walking or if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself 
against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Let's again go to Ephesians chapter six and verse 10. So Ephesians chapter six and verse 10. Good afternoon, Linda Lumpkin, glad you joined us. We got a couple other people, I see phone numbers, but I can't tell who you are. Ephesians chapter six and verse 10 through 20 says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I wanna talk about how to get victories in spiritual warfare, how to get victories in spiritual warfare. Last week, if you'll recall, last week we were talking about the fact that um, Jesus defeated the enemy's uh, plan of attack against him in the wilderness uh, in Matthew chapter four by using the word of God. Remember we talked about um, that after the baptism of Jesus, he had an, uh, an opening from heaven the spirit of God descended like a dove and sat upon him and the, the word of God, the voice of God, the father spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And we talked about right after an opening in Christ's life, then there followed opposition. He was led, we talked about right by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the devil after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And when the enemy came in, he tempted Jesus with three things, the lust of the flesh, turn these stones into bread that you might eat, the lust of the eye, told him to cast yourself down off this mountain and the angels will give their charge over thee and the pride of life. He said, I'll give you all of these kingdoms if you bow down and worship me. He tempted Jesus with three things, the same three things that he will tempt you and me with, whether it be turning stones into bread for Jesus or trying to do something unnatural or trying to, to show off uh, for other people or trying to uh, be in pride. Uh, the enemy tries to come and cause us to fall or to stumble with these same three weapons. And Jesus defeated the enemy, remember, by quoting the word of God. He kept saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. And the way to get spiritual victories is by using the word of God. And the reason I want to talk about this is I believe God is using this season to bring in and usher in some wonderful opportunities for the body of Christ. Uh, even as we have, um, looks like weathered the storm of the pandemic, although we know COVID-19 is still out there, we know the virus is still effective, it's still um, dangerous and it's still deadly in some cases. Many people have gotten vaccinated, many people um, have used social distancing and mask wearing and washing of hands. Even as we've come through seemingly the worst of the pandemic, I believe there are opportunities that God wants to open up for the church. We're starting to go back into our worship. We're starting to come back together as a church family. We're starting to have engaging church fellowships again. And I believe these are opportunities for God to get the glory out of our church life corporately. But I also believe there's some opportunities that God wants to present to you personally, some doors that he wants to open and some ways that he wants to make. Um, there are people who have testimonies that even during this pandemic, they got jobs and better jobs. And other people have had bonuses and raises come into their household. Other people have had 
uh, bills paid off and financial blessings have come. And I don't believe God has finished blessing us yet in that area. There are people who are believing God for healings in their bodies and, and believing God for health and strength in this season. I believe God is going to do that according to his promise and according to his word that by his stripes we're healed. We are uh, believing God for great things within our families, husbands and wives getting closer to Christ and getting closer to each other, mothers and fathers providing godly leadership for sons and daughters and those sons and daughters and mothers and fathers drawing closer to each other in this season, believing for souls to continue to be saved. In Acts chapter two, the Bible says, as the church did what they were supposed to do, God was faithful in doing what he was supposed to do. He added to the church daily those that were being saved. And so we're expecting people to come back to church, come back to Christ, give their life to Christ for the forgiveness of sin. And there are just so many doors that I believe God is preparing and already opening for us. And whenever there are opportunities presented to Christians, you can best believe there's going to be opposition that comes along the way. There's this, there's this feeling in Christendom, there's this thought pattern that can creep into our minds that, that pastor, why am I going through so many things? Why do I have so much opposition? I'm going to church, I'm tithing, I'm listening to you in Bible study, I'm praying. I just don't see why I've got so much opposition. It might be because God has given you so many opportunities. He's opened so many doors and he's made so many ways that you should expect that along with your opportunities are going to come opposition. When, when, when you have opposition in your life, it might be a great time to look and see and celebrate the fact that I'm going in the right direction. <laughs> you know, when a football player is on the football field uh, and there's a line of scrimmage, the offense is trying to get into the end zone, they have to go through the opposition. And if the running back or the quarterback or the wide receiver starts running in the opposite direction, they'll never run into the enemy. It's only when they are pursuing their goal, when they're going toward the end zone and they're going toward trying to score, do they run into the opposition? <laughs> so it is in football, I believe. And so it is in the faith. When you start moving in the direction of your goals, praying for certain things, believing certain things, walking out your faith in certain directions, you can best believe you're gonna run into opposition. So the question becomes today, if I'm gonna have opposition pastor, how do I handle the opposition that comes my way? And that's what I wanna encourage you today is that God has not left us alone without some armor and without some artillery to be able to handle the attacks of the enemy. And so I wanted to look at these two passages of scripture um, principally in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, but I wanted to go back and look at Ephesians chapter six because God gives us uh, some strategies, some plans about how to deal with opposition. And I'm probably looking at some people and, and sharing with some people today that if you hit unmute and I gave you an opportunity to share, you would say, Pastor, I'm, I'm glad you're teaching on this today because I'm facing some opposition. <laughs> I've got some situations in my life, even right now, as soon as I get off this Zoom call that I'm going to have to deal with. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna deal with it. I've been trying to fight it. I've been trying to do it. I've been trying to take care of it, but I just can't seem to handle it on my own. Well, I'm glad you tuned into the Zoom call today. I'm glad you tuned into the Bible study today because God through his Holy Spirit and through his word is going to give you the strategies about how to be successful in spiritual warfare. And the first thing that you have to do each and every day is put on the whole armor of God, right? And I've taught you on this uh, uh, many a times, so it's, it's worth repeating and worth going over review. Each and every day when you get up, um, like a soldier that goes to battle, if you're gonna survive the attacks of the enemy, you've gotta put on the armor of your everlasting God. You gotta put on your spiritual armor. Yes, put on your clothes. Yes, get ready for work. Yes, get ready to do what you have to do for the day physically, but make sure you're prepared for the battles spiritually, right? And in Ephesians here, we're, we're told, remember, have your waist uh, with the, the belt of truth, right? Uh, guard your private areas with the truth of God's word. When that soldier would put on that belt, he would go around uh, their private parts. And so 
the areas that are most vulnerable to us, the areas that no, most people can't see, we have to gird them and guard them and hide them and cover them in the word of God. Amen. Then he says, and put on the breastplate of righteousness, right? Um, the breastplate is that piece of armor that carried or covered the vital organs of the soldier. It covered their heart, it covered their lungs, it covered their intestines, it covered their vital organs. And, and Paul says to us, put on the breastplate of righteousness. In other words, cover the vital areas of your life with right living. Try to align yourself or align your life with what is right. And we know God's word is right. So each and every morning when we get up, that's why we need to read the word of God, to realign my heart, to realign my mind, to realign my thoughts and my meditations, and my intentions and my activities, to align them with what is right. Don't align them with necessarily what is good or what is necessarily what is profitable or what necessarily is politically correct in the days and times in which we live. No, we have to shoot for a higher standard and align our lives, our hearts, our aim with the righteousness of God, which is Jesus Christ and his word. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. And then he says, what? Um, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, right? As you, if you're gonna go into battle, uh, one of the reasons that the, the people suggested, historians suggested that the Roman soldiers were so successful in so many different campaigns of war and so many different terrains that they would have to fight in, it was because they had superior footwear. They had spiked shoes or spiked um, um, boots that they could use to battle and to be stable no matter what terrain they were going in. And oftentimes, because the Romans would invade a particular area, they would sometimes have to fight an uphill battle. <laughs> when they would fight, um, people would know that they were coming. So they would head to the hills and fortify themselves in hilly places or mountainous areas. And so the Romans would end up having to fight uphill. But the way that they would be able to climb uphill and, and be stable in the battle is because they had their feet shod with the right footwear they had spikes they had these things that would grab into the ground which would give them a foothold have you ever felt like you were fighting something and you were battling uphill you were fighting against the odds you were going against the grain you were fighting up an uphill battle and it's one thing to fight as they say on a level playing field it's another thing to fight when the odds are stacked against you when things are seemingly coming down on you but you can do it if you've got your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When you get up in the morning again and you read the word of God and you hide it in your heart and you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and you believe that when you put your faith in it, it activates the power of God in your life, no matter what the odds look like in your day, no matter how big the giant that comes your way, no matter what is against you, when you know that God is for you, then you can go with courage and strength and stamina and stay in the fight and be stable because your foundation is based upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you got the belt plate of, of, of truth, you got the breastplate of righteousness, you got your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then he says in verse 16, take the shield of faith in which you're able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy, right? When we fight, I talked about this before, uh, there are times when the enemy fights you from a distance. You can't see it coming. You can't see him uh, and what he's doing until it's too late. He'll fire some off in an email or hit your email, messes up your whole day. <laughs> you, you have a conversation with somebody, all of a sudden the conversation turns left. You had no idea it was going to go in that direction. And now you're all out of sorts and you, you're all off your mark. Uh, you go to the doctor thinking it's just a regular everyday checkup only to discover they found a lump where there's not supposed to be a lump or they found a spot where there's not supposed to be a spot. And now you're, you're shaking up um, all of these. You listen to something on the news. You're just walking around your house doing whatever you do and something in the news hits you. And now you're, you're nervous, you're anxious, you're worried. These are these are fiery darts that the enemy shoots from a distance. And God says the way to handle that, right, remember, 
is to take the shield of faith, which is able to quench those fiery darts that when they hit, they won't burn your house down. They won't mess up your whole day. Um, your faith is able to put those fires out before they have a chance to destroy what God is developing in your life. I'm trying to get through these really quickly because I want to get to second Corinthians, but I need you to remember what the armor of God is. He says, and then Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation, making sure your thinking is right, remembering that you've been saved for purpose. You've been saved on purpose and you've been saved for purpose. When Jesus died on the cross and God raised him from, his, from the dead and his blood was shed and then God's grace hit your life so that you would put your faith in the death, burial and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins. When God saved your soul, um, he didn't just save your soul so that you could live with him eternally in heaven. But God saved you and left you here on this earth because he had something he wanted you to do. And as long as a soldier's helmet was on, it was a sign that he was still in the fight. When a helmet, when a soldier would take his helmet off, it was a sign that the battle was over. And so you and I got to keep the helmet of salvation on. We got to stay in the fight. Don't take your helmet off. It's is not over. The enemy's still out there. He's still got snipers. He's still got mine, landmines. He's still got traps and tricks that he's trying to trip you up with. He still has a plan to destroy you and take you out. So you got to keep the helmet of salvation on. You got to stay in the fight. If I was with you, I would get up close to you and just whisper in your ear and tell you, stay in the fight. You're going to get the victory. I want to be like a good trainer in the corner. Just stay in the fight. Just go back out there one more time, one more round. This might be the time you knock him out for good and get rid of him, but you won't win if you quit. But if you stay in the fight, keeping the helmet of salvation on, God will give you the victory in the end. And then he says, take um, the verse, be, be a uh, part of verse 17, uh, take with you the helmet of salvation, the B part says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay. So, God says, put on the whole armor of God, belt plate of righteousness, our belt plate of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's the armor that God tells you to take. But then he, then he talks about some artillery that he gives you for the battle, right? And the artillery is what? The word of God. He says, take with you the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. That's the one piece of offensive weaponry that he gives us for the battle. It is the word of God. That's why I've been trying to help us and remind us to stay uh, in the word and to remember the word, memorize it, hide it in your heart, go over it in your mind, keep reciting it and remembering it. Why? Because it is the sword of the spirit. It is the weapon that the spirit is going to use to get the spiritual victories in the battles that you come up against, okay? So that's the armor and it's the start of the artillery, all right? Now, I quickly wanna move over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, because I want you to see something. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and um, I wanna go through, start at verse three. He says, are you there? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse three, I want to connect these two, two verses to help you get victory in your spiritual battle. Verse three says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, all right? Now this is critical because what can get us mixed up in this fight, what can get us mixed up in this battle is the difference between our walking and our warfare. He says, even though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. In other words, we have to live out this life that we live for Jesus. We live it out what? In the flesh. We have to live it out physically in this world in which we live in. We are spirits and souls that live in bodies. And as we live this life in Christ, we live it uh, in a body that God has given to us. And so that's how we are to walk. And we walk by faith, but we have to walk it out in these physical bodies that we're in. However, even though we walk in the flesh, even though we walk in these physical bodies, 
our warfare is not physical, but it is spiritual. This is one of the first things that the enemy will do is he will mess with our mindset. <laughs> he will mess with our thoughts. He will mess with the way we see life such that we never really understand the battlefield that we're on. If the enemy can keep us confused about where the battle is taking place, then he can take advantage of us in the battle, right? Um, when I'm playing checkers with my kids, I don't, I don't let them win a thing. I don't let them win anything in checkers. I don't, I don't, let, them, I don't let them win in checkers, uh, basketball, Xbox, anything. And uh, when they were little, well, they can beat me in that some of that stuff now because they're better at Xbox. They got better dexterity. They're in better shape. But coming to checkers, I still beat them every time. And and the reason I beat them every time is I, I I act like I'm playing the game on this side of the board when really I'm setting them up for something else on the other side of the board. And and that's what the enemy is trying to help us. That's what the enemy tries to do when he goes at us. He tries to confuse us about where the battle is really taking place. He, he wants to make you think that the battle is in the flesh. That's why when you start arguing with people or you get mad at other people and you start cursing them or dressing them down or trying to talk to them and, and, and work through it from a fleshly standpoint, it, it, it only gets you so far or in many cases, it doesn't work at all. Why? Because the battle is not a fleshly battle. The battle is a spiritual battle. That's why when we try to handle the issues in this life with politics and finances and all of that kind of stuff, and I believe God works through the systems and, and the, the systemic issues that we face, but he works through it with spiritual weapons. But if the enemy can keep us using carnal weapons, we'll never make any progress and get the victories, <clears throat> excuse me, that God wants us to get. And so this is the first thing that you and I have to do is recognize, yes, pastor, I live, we live in these fleshly bodies. We live in this world, but our war is not according to the flesh, right? That's verse three. And verse four says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. When you and I fight battles in our flesh, we are fighting from a weakened position. We're fighting and we don't have strength in our flesh. You don't have enough strength. You don't have enough brain power. You don't have enough stamina in the day. You don't have enough willpower in your flesh to get the victory that God wants you to get. But when you flip over and realize that our warfare is not carnal, but it is mighty in God, now you got the enemy on the run. He says, our warfare is mighty in God. That's where you and I get the victory is in God. Our victories are in Christ Jesus. Our victories are in the power of his Holy Spirit. When you and I are fighting in the spirit, when we're fighting in the power of the Holy Spirit, now we have guaranteed victories. That's why at the close of the, the verses that we talked about in Ephesians, it talked about the attack, talked about the artillery. It says what? Taking with you the what? Sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Because the word of God, the sword of the spirit is mighty. It is powerful. That word mighty that word, uh, it means powerful, it means strong, it means just what it says, it is mighty. Whatever you're facing today, whatever opposition has come your way, whatever trial, whatever trouble, whatever uh, trick the enemy has put in your way, whatever obstacle he's put there, God's word and the weapons of God's warfare, the spiritual weapons that he gives us are able to get the victory over whatever you are facing in this life. And again, what the enemy would want you to do is put the word down and start fighting with worldly weapons. He would want you to put down spiritual uh, artillery and start fighting with fleshly artillery. Don't fall for the trick of the enemy. 
Stay with the spiritual weapons that God has given. Why? He says, because they're mighty for God, mighty in God, excuse me, for here it is, pulling down strongholds. I love that. He gives us a picture of what we are up against. He says that some of the battles that we are facing, before we can get the victory, we've got to be able to pull down the stronghold. You know what a stronghold is, don't you? Uh, when the armies uh, would be out on the battlefield, every now and then the enemy would hole up or find itself in a castle or a fortress or something called a stronghold. And it was a walled in armory. It was a walled in fortress or, or, or brick uh, mortar castle that the enemy would hide behind. And that's sometimes where he shoots those fiery darts from. And he fights from this, this, this place, this, this fortress. And, and unless or until we can dis, dismantle and demolish the stronghold, we can't get rid of the enemy in our lives. And when the enemy comes in, what he's trying to do is take territory for himself from God in your life and in mine. He's trying to take territory. He's trying to occupy spaces in your life and your thought process and your prayer life and your daytime and your calendar. He's trying to occupy that space. And when he occupies it, he sets up a stronghold. And that is, that is a sign that that territory belongs to him. And in order to kick him out, you got to tear down the stronghold. And that's what Paul says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, right? And really what he's talking about is really thoughts in our minds. He's really talking about ideas that the enemy has set up in our minds. He's really talking about ways of thinking that have been set up in our imagination. And he says that, that if we're going to win the battle in the mind, the first thing we got to do is be able to pull down a stronghold. And when the armies on the battlefield, what they would do is they would have to get close enough to the stronghold and they would, they would, they would take a, a, a battle ram or a battle axe and they would just bang against it or they would take some ropes and they would put it on the, the towers in the in, in the castle and they would use horses and mighty men to pull those ropes and to pull against that castle until they, they pulled it down. And what God is telling us is that we've got to be able to, with spiritual weapons, pull down strongholds that have been taken up residence in our heads. And so let me ask you this, what kind of strongholds has the enemy been setting up in your thought processes? What kind of strongholds has the enemy been setting up in your imaginations? Whether it's through conversations that you had with people, whether it's through movies maybe that you watched or articles that you read or news reports or however it comes in, what strongholds have been set up in your mindset? Uh, maybe where people say, Pastor, I just don't think I'm gonna be able to make it through this. That's a stronghold. Uh, Pastor, I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to handle what I'm facing. This is too difficult for me. Pastor, I'm ready to quit. You just don't know how hard it is. And, and man, if you, were, if you knew how hard it was, Pastor, you would see that I'm ready to quit and give up and throw, up the, throw in the towel. That's evidence that a stronghold has been set up. Why? Because the word of God says in, in Philippians 4.13 that you and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Yes, in the flesh, I want to give up. Yes, in the flesh, you may want to quit. And the enemy has set up a stronghold telling us to quit and throw in the towel and, and don't fight anymore. But the word of God says we can, hallelujah, do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And when you and I have a stronghold and identify that stronghold, it's not going to come down unless we apply the word of God to it. Again, I go back to that's why it's so important that you memorize scripture and you meditate on it every day. That's the only way to pull down these strongholds, these little thought processes, these things that have, that have um, migrated into our mindset and have set up a, a, a thought process that, that is hard for us to get past. Uh, I see it all the time when I'm in counseling. I see it all the time when I'm in counseling with people. They come into my office for advice on 
family or, or, or business or work or, 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 or relationship issues, whatever the case may be. And I see it all the time. There's some people who are full of faith and full of the word of God. And all I need to do is remind them of what the word has to say about their situation. And they walk out on fire. Like pastor, that's all I needed is just thank you for reminding me about the word of God and how it works in my life. Then I have other people because they have a stronghold that's been set up. Even though I remind them about what the word of God says, they're living so much in doubt that they don't believe that the word of God can do what it says it can do. And in order for us to make progress, we have to hallelujah, pull down that stronghold so they can get back to walking in faith in what God has called them to do. And that's where verse five comes in, casting down arguments. And here it is, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, let me go a little deeper here in our teaching. He says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, remember I told you, we ought to take the shield of faith to be able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. And we ought to take and put on the helmet of salvation, which covers our thinking. But every now and then, if you don't put on the whole arm, if I don't put on the whole arm, if I don't keep my head straight, sometimes the enemy can hit us with a thought. And sometimes we can't control the thoughts that come into our mind, but we can control the thoughts that stay there. Right? The enemy is so shrewd, he's so um, keen in the way he operates that he'll plant a thought in your mind. Even while I'm teaching right now, even while the Holy Spirit is ministering right now, the, the enemy has planted some thoughts that are off topic about what I've been teaching. And, and you sometimes and I sometimes can't keep those thoughts from coming in. Sometimes I'm trying to listen to something somebody's saying and before I know it, I'm thinking about something way off in left field or I'm thinking about something that's way off the topic has nothing to do with what we're talking about. And I can't necessarily keep that thought from coming in, but I can keep that thought from staying there. And the Bible says I can take it captive, right? You know what it means to take something captive. It means when you take control of it, and when you have control of it, then you can kick it out anytime you want. Here's something that'll help you. Whatever you are worried about, whatever has you concerned, go back and find the origin of the concern. What is it that you're anxious about? And it's probably because some thought about what's happening, right? If you get a diagnosis, you start thinking about what are all of the bad things that can happen if this diagnosis is true or if it plays, it's, runs its course in my body. You hear something about your children, you hear something about your family, and, and you start thinking about all of the things that might happen, could happen, may happen, uh, are likely to happen if they keep going in this particular direction. And it is all of these thoughts that have run wild with us that then causes us to become so anxious and so worried and tied up in the knots. The stuff hadn't even happened yet, but we are operating and feeling like as if it has already happened. That's because a thought can have a powerful impact on us, even if it hasn't manifested in reality in our life. And the, 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 the word of God tells us we don't have to live with those thoughts. The word says that as a person thinketh in their hearts, so are they. If you think about peaceful thoughts, you're going to be peaceful. But if you think about anxious thoughts, you're going to be anxious. If you think about the word of God, you're going to operate like the word tells you to operate. If you think about what's going on in the world, you're gonna operate and look more and more like the world. As a person thinketh in their heart, so are they. And so in order to change what's going on on the outside, 
I got to take down what's happening on the inside. I got to take every thought captive that tries to exalt itself above the knowledge of God. In other words, when a thought comes in that is contrary to what I already know about God, then I have to take that thought captive because it does not belong there, right? Again, let me go back to this, this concept of peace. If, if I'm worried and wringing my hands and nervous and, and whoa, I don't know what's gonna happen and I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm on edge and my heart is always racing and, and, and I'm just tied up in knots, right? I know that's not how I'm supposed to live, right? I understand why I'm like, like that because I got some bad news. I've been thinking on some stuff, I'm worried about it. You know, any person in, 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 in their right mind would be worried about the stuff that I heard if I'm in my flesh. But I also heard in the word in Philippians chapter four, verse six, that the peace of God will guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So which one am I going to believe? The reality of what my thoughts are telling me that I should be worried and anxious and nervous and all that? Or am I gonna believe what the knowledge about what God's word says is that I can have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. I'm gonna choose the latter. I'm gonna stick with God. I'm gonna choose to have the peace of God which passes all understanding. And so I have to take that anxious thought, that worrisome thought and bring it captive up under the knowledge about what I know the word of God says. So here's how worrying and dealing with that works in my life. When I'm worried about something, I go back to again, Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing. Whatever it is, no matter how hard or bad or difficult or, 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 or whatever the issue is, I, he says, be anxious for nothing. But instead, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, then I have to ask myself, Eric, have you prayed about this? Have you, have you thanked God for the good things that are going on? Have you, have you asked God to handle this? He says, then if you've prayed with thanksgiving and supplication, have I made my request made known to God? Yes then I can expect the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. No matter what I understand about my problem, the peace of God that surpasses that will guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. He will set up a century guard around my heart and my mind so that that worrisome thought doesn't cause me to lose the battle with what God is getting ready to do. And that's just one example in, in the area of worry of how we take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ, to the obedience of his word, because that's how we're going to get spiritual victories in the world in which we live in. We got to stay in God's word. Why? Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds. And it gives us the opportunity to take thoughts captive. I might not be able to keep them from coming. You may not be able to keep them from coming in. But when they come in and they're contrary to what we know God's word says, we can take it captive and bring it, bring it into obedience with what the word of God has to say in my life. And when I do that, he says that we will get spiritual victories. We will be ready to punish all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. Today, as you move forward, don't forget this is not a worldly battle. It's not a fleshly battle. It's a spiritual battle. Since it's a spiritual battle, you got to put on your spiritual armor and you got to take your spiritual artillery into the battle. Because whenever God gives you great op uh, opportunity, you can get ready to face opposition. But the way to win over the opposition is by obedience to Christ, obedience to his word. And then you will be able to feel or fulfill the opportunities that God has before you. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. I pray your word will be matched to the needs of your people. I pray if there's any questions, God, or any um, things that needed to be edited in, you would do that, or anything that needed to be edited out, you would do that as well. Let your word fall upon good ground and bring forth fruit in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, one, open it up for any, any questions. I know I covered quite a bit of ground in a short period of time, but I did want to open it up for any questions. I see my friend, brother, Pastor David Page has joined us from New Baptist Church. Glad to have him on. 
today. Um, any questions about how to get spiritual victories with the arm of God and the artillery of God in your life? Any questions about that? Pastor, this is uh, Sister Green, and that Sister. was a very, very good lesson to put in my heart. And uh, with my bone cancer, I take my faith over fear. And that's how I get through with God's words. So I'm hoping that there's something that, um, that I know keeps me bounded and and reaching for his love and his words. Yes, yes, and, and I, I, I know that um, when you're up against something like that and um, you are battling something in your flesh and battling something in your body, um, when you take God's word and something spiritual, he's able to handle even you know issues in our bones sharper than any two-edged sword. Um, dividing bone from marrow. God's word is able to operate deep in us for healing, but it's also able to operate outside of us in defending and giving us victories. And so Sister Green, I, I know you're a strong woman of faith, been in faith a while now. So keep at the word of God. It is a mighty to the pulling down of strongholds as we read here in Second Corinthians today. So be encouraged with that. Thank you for sharing. Who else? Good afternoon, Pastor, and man, thank you uh, for just the period I jumped in. You just convicted me, and I just got to confess, uh, you talked about putting on that armor for us to be able to be protected, and some days, I'm just going to be honest, I hadn't put it on today, I'm just going literally to the Word of God and Ephesians, as we both know, and I may have missed it, but I didn't put it on today, and I'm going ready to pray now that I put on this armor because we need the armor of God on. And I heard you say that. I was just quickening my spirit because I had not did that, Pastor, just being honest with you. Yeah, and, and I, I, I'm with you. And that's why Paul, thank you for sharing that, Pastor Page. And that's, that's why Paul told us that it's confusing sometimes because we walk in the flesh, but we don't war according to the flesh, right? It's, it's really easy. It's second nature. You would never hope go outside naked. We would never go outside naked. We always put our clothes on. Uh, hopefully y'all wouldn't come on Zoom without having your clothes on and your face made up and all the things you need to do. That's just natural and normal in this life we live in, right? In fact, if we go outside naked, somebody gonna pull us to the side and think something wrong with us. <laughs> um, but that's how, we, that's how we live. We live in this flesh. But as Pastor Page said, and we're all are guilty of it, we have to walk every day with the armor of God on because we're walking into and we are in a spiritual battle. And just like a soldier wouldn't go into the war without his helmet and his armor on and, and all the things that he's been given by the government to protect him, you and I shouldn't walk in spiritual battles without putting, first of all, our armor on, but also taking with us the artillery. Um, you know, it's one thing to be, to have the armor on, but it's another thing to have your artillery with you. You need both uh, to be armed and uh, to have your protection with you. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a message for all of us, Pastor, to be reminded to, to do that. Thank you for sharing that. Who else? Pastor, I was gonna say um, on that same line, I almost feel like it's just so constant. Um, it just seems like back in the day, you didn't have to just necessarily have it on all the time. <laughs> but for me, I'm just like, Lord, I, I, I can't go to work without it on. I can't watch the TV. You know, I'm a big political buff. So God is convicting me on turn off MSNBC. Let it go a little bit because you're getting out of hand with some of your comments. You know? <laughs> so, but I just feel exhausted sometimes. I just feel like you have to have it on 24 hours a day. And I don't remember it being this bad back in the day. So then I go back to, okay, well, the world coming to an end. So we 
really got to have it on. But I mean, do we really have to have it on? Like we really, you know, I guess my question is, I just feel like it's on 24 hours. And if I just take a break, something gonna happen. So am I sleeping in my armor and I'm walking in my armor? I mean, you know, so help me with this because it's just all the time. Well, yeah. So Sister Stephanie, you raised a couple of very good points. Let me, let me address a couple of them. Um, we do know that um, the end times are coming. Um, and we're going to get back into our study of Revelation when we come back together as a church family. And I don't know when Christ is going to make his return and finally you know, put an end to all of this, but I know it's closer than it was yesterday. And the closer we get to the end times, the more desperate the spiritual warfare becomes. And so things are getting worse and worse. And you can see it if you watch the news, you just watch what's going on in the community. That is certainly happening. That's, that's from a world standpoint and a systematic thing that's going on with, with what's going on in our, in our world. But also personally, um, when, when we... When we don't necessarily, when, let me say it this way positively, when you start trying to move in the directions that God has for you, then you're going to face more opposition. Um, there was a time in my life, if I'm honest, um, when I really wasn't walking with God. Um, I knew who he was. I, I knew what my mother had taught me. I knew what I learned in Sunday school, but I really wasn't walking in the direction that God had for me. I wasn't walking in the direction of my ministry. I wasn't walking in the direction of my pastorate. I was walking contrary to that. And when you walk in contrary to that, you really don't need the armor because the enemy ain't bothering you because <laughs> you're, not, you're not going against him. And so there are certain times and certain seasons when um, we're not in the fight. We're, we're what Pastor Page would know this. We're uh, AWOL, absent without leave. <laughs> we walked off the base. <laughs> we, we down somewhere in the, in, in the tavern drinking, having a good time. Well, the enemy's not really going to bother you then because you're not a threat. But when you decide I'm gonna be on Bible study every Wednesday, I'm gonna be I'm gonna serve in my church, I'm gonna be a prayer warrior, I'm gonna be an agent for change, then you are now on the front lines of the battle. And yes, you need the armor on all the time because the enemy um, is not playing with us and he doesn't take a break. Uh, he's at his job 24/7. So we do need we do need the armor on, and we do need uh, to be encouraged with the saints. Um, that we're in this together. That's why the Bible says in, in Psalm 91, one can put a thousand flight, two can put 10,000 flight. Um, so we don't have to fight this battle by ourselves. We can fight it, fight it together. But yes, we need that armor on all the time, Sister Stephanie, got to have it on all of the time. I hope that gives some perspective about the times in which we live in and the season in which we may be in personally as we walk in with God. Who else? Hey, Pastor. Hey, Eric. Hey, so I was listening. Um, I thought about what you said that when thoughts sometimes come across your mind and sometimes, you know, we can't let them sit there. You got to cast that thought down, right? Yeah. And I'm, I remember you have said in the past that we ought to um, stick to the scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, we ought to um, start feed our faith and starve our doubt, right? Mm -hmm. Not not only that, but the scripture uh, memorization that we're doing is giving us what we need. So when those thoughts and things come, uh, we can cast those thoughts down. We can bring that thought down into the um, into where God wants it to be under his foot. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for what we're doing now. Because sometimes thoughts and things come and they sit there and if we, you know, so it's a man thinking his heart, so it is, as, as you just said, but we have, all we have is the word, where the word of God is our, our is our weapon. So um Thank you for reinforcing that on today's Bible study because I needed that. I needed to stay focused on that. Yeah, it's a battle. It's a constant battle, like the sister just said. And yeah. they going. No, it's not going anywhere. And it's not something that um, is new to, to, to believers. I remember 
uh, in the Old Testament. Remember when Elijah was doing battle against um, Jezebel and her 400 prophets of Baal and he went up on Mount Carmel and he had a great spiritual victory and, and proved that God is in fact God, God answered by fire. And um, right after that, he had a wonderful experience on the mountain. He, God showed up for him. Uh, people believed in God again. And then right after that, Jezebel said she was gonna kill him. And, and the prophet went on, he went, went running away from her and was exhausted. And when he finally fell down and fell asleep, he had a conversation with God. He said, God, I'm the only one left. He, he thought he was the only one that was still in the battle. And, and God had to remind Elijah, Elijah, get real. I got 700 others who not bowed down the knee to Baal. And what I wanna bring that up to say, Eric, to your point is when we are in the battle and we get exhausted, sometimes we can feel like we're the only one in it. Sometimes we can feel like we're losing as Christians. Sometimes we can feel like we're behind, but the reality is we're victorious. We're winning, we on the winning side. <laughs> this is a fixed fight. You already have been declared the winner. You won uh, the day that Jesus died on the cross and God raised him from the dead and you put your faith and belief in him. You are more than a conqueror through Christ who loves you. <laughs> Jesus got the victory over sin and death and hell and the grave, First Corinthians says. And so when we got on the Jesus team, when we got in Christ, we, we received his victory. We already are crowned in heavenly places <laughs> with spiritual blessings in high places. We are we are already blessed. So the enemy can play with our minds to make us think, oh, this is, the outcome is, is questionable. It's still to be decided. No, we by faith have already got the victory and the word is what reminds us of that. So when we stay in that word, we do feed our faith and starve our doubts and we do get um, encouragement that the victory is already there. We just gotta stay in the battle, stay in the fight and watch God crown us the victor. Who else? Got time for one more. All right. All right. Mother, thank you for joining us from Tennessee. We're glad to have you. Uh, thank you for taking care of your daughter, our, our sister. We, we love them very, very much. Glad to uh, see you. I really, enjoy, I really enjoyed the study. Oh, and, and you gave me some points because I tend to make requests of God and instead of leaving it in his hands, I take it back. Mm -hmm. So you've kind of helped me telling me about staying in the word that, uh, so you said some things that will help me to leave it in his hands and not take it back and try to take charge. Amen. Leave Thank it. you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I'm uh, glad to have you on. I see Sister Dina Rose joined us. Sister Sharon Reed joined us as well since we were on. Again, thank you all for being on. Um, we'll, we'll close out the month of June. And then remember, we won't have Bible study in the month of July. Um, Mr. Mika will be getting with you. Uh, we're going to have our next live worship service. I believe it's on Monday the 21st. Monday the 21st. And um, if you weren't able to make the last one, Mr. Mika will be getting to you about uh, the invitation process and being able to come to that. Um, if you feel comfortable coming into the building and want to worship live that Monday night, I believe it's at seven. And uh, so there'll be more details coming about that. But please lift that in prayer as we prepare to come back in our building in, in this first phase. Ideally, we're going to be back the first Sunday in August on Sunday morning at nine o'clock. So please be lifting that up as well. Um, so I thank you all for being on. I pray this Bible study is a blessing. If you want to go back and listen to it, D'Amica records them and post them on our YouTube channel. So you can go out there and re-listen to it. If you miss something, I want to go over it again. I want to talk about it with some other family and friends and, and, and have a devotion in, in your house about it. It's a great way to do that. Uh, just to keep the word fresh uh, in your mind, keep it fresh in your spirit. Uh, as Pastor Page said, we're all guilty of rushing into our day without the armor or rushing into our day without the right artillery. And if you do that, just, just pause and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Thank you for covering me. Get that armor on, get that artillery in your hand and then go uh, conquering as a conquering saint uh, in our conquering savior, amen. Let me pray for you, pronounce the benediction over you and I'll see you next time.
Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word and thank you for your people. Thank you for this time that was set aside for you. Now, Lord God, I pray according to 1 Chronicles chapter 4 that you would bless us indeed. I pray you would enlarge our territories today, that we would have influence and impact in the lives of others for you. I pray you would keep us from causing pain. You would keep us from the evil one. And I pray, Lord God, you would do this today and every day you send our way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Love y'all in the Lord. I'll see y'all, talk to y'all soon. Uh, be victorious.